Welcome to our seminar. I'm Zane Bortold. Zane is an assistant prof at the uh, EC department at Cornell. He's been there since 2019. Before that, he was a blitz at MIT and the overlap. And then uh, he got his PhD from uh, Shek, oh, sorry, uh, the Ben Gurion University in Israel. And uh, he has received several awards. I mean, I definitely have to check the list Career Award, IBM University Award. Uh, the Rothschild Fellowship and the Michael Tian Excellent Teaching Award, and many other awards, and he has been doing excellent work in information theory, statistical machine learning, and optimal transport theory. And today he's going to talk about some of his recent work in optimal transport. Uh, it's great to have you here, and uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. First time for me, I think, yeah. Well, so, I think. Appreciate the hospitality. We're really excited to be here and uh, you know chat with uh, what we're uh, meeting with uh, later today. So yeah, looking forward to that. Now, for the talk of today, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Grove of Watson slide system, which is this fascinating object that essentially quantifies the discrepancy between probability distributions that can be supported on completely different spaces by, in some sense, aligning them. With one another. And as such, these types of distances became quite popular recently for various applications that involve alignment of heterogeneous data sets. And as a consequence, you know, they also started to attract attention of theoreticians trying to understand their structural, their statistical, their computational properties. But the thing is, because this is a relatively new problem, roughly a decade old, a lot of very basic foundational questions in this space remain open. And today I want to share with you some nice. Um, algorithmic and statistical recent advancements we have in this topic, thanks to a new duality theory that uh, we've been able to devise. And yeah, I mean, without we get started, please feel free to stop you with questions on the fly. I'm happy to take those as uh, the talk progresses. But because the growth of Wasserstein is really based off optimal transportation, I would like to spend my first few minutes talking about the optimal transport problem. If anything, just to kind of set up basic ideas and notations, but also to perhaps surface some of the gaps and give a sense for where a Gromov of Wasserstein type of formulation or alignment problem, where the need for that really comes from, all right? But yeah, let's start with optimal transport. And at its core, this is really a question about comparing probability distributions by quantifying the overall cost associated with transporting or reshaping one distribution into another. And this is a very old problem, it dates back, what now, 250 years ago, roughly, to the 18th century. The French mathematician Gaspard Mouge, who originally formulated it as follows. So we're looking at minimizing this total cost of transportation over here. And the minimization is overall what we call transport or transportation maps, which are essentially the deterministic functions from the X space where mu is supported to the Y space where mu lives, such that T pushes forward mu into onto mu. All right. And just for concreteness, if you think about this simple Gaussian example over here, well, your transport map will essentially just be a translation in that simple situation. And yeah, I mean, this is the idea. I think it all makes sense, quite intuitive. And actually, under enough regularity and smoothness assumptions, this is also a well told mathematical problem with deep connections to partial differential equations, to fluid dynamics, and the like. But one of the problems with this Mooch formulation is that it doesn't really play all that well with discrete distributions in the absence of smoothness. And this is often what we care about when we deal with data. And I mean, there's a bunch of issues here to uh, be surfaced. The first of all is the fact that transport maps between the three distributions need not even necessarily exist, right? Just think about the simple situation where you want to transport the point maps to, well, basically anything else, right? Mooch does not allow you to split maps because you're working with deterministic functions. So, I mean, in this simple situation, indeed, the set of transport maps is empty. The problem is not even well defined. But in, let's say that you're a practitioner, you don't really care about this type of thing. You classify it as a pathology. Just think of it as some optimization problem that you want to code up and implement on your computer. Well, if you try to do that, you also quickly realize that this is quite a horrible optimization problem to try and deal with. First of all, this optimization domain over here is not convex. In fact, it's not even closed under any reasonable topology. This optimization objective, again, highly not convex, not linear in the decision variable T. So I mean, all in all, Munch definitely had the right physical idea in mind when setting up this optimal transport problem. But in order to get something that is workable with discrete distributions, again, can account for data and empirical measures, we do need a little bit more. And 
really, it turns out that the core issue of this Munch formulation is this inability to split mass. And this was accounted for in 1942 by the Russian mathematician Leonid Kantorovich. He got a Nobel Prize in economics for his work on optimal transport. And Kantorovich's idea was to basically relax this deterministic function requirement to a soft one, which he modeled using the notion of couplings. So let me explain how that worked. And I'll denote by this cap pi of mu nu over here, the set of all couplings of my marginal distribution, where a coupling is just a joint probability distribution on the product space that has mu and mu as its corresponding marginals. And if you really think of a coupling as a randomized transportation map, one that now allows you to pick up the mass at x and split it across the entire y space, if this is what you want to do. And up to this fact, I mean, the formulation stays pretty much the same, minimized total cost of transportation, but this time over the set of all couplings, which are modeling these randomized transportation maps, if you will, right? And that's the Kantorovich optimal transport problem. Nowadays, I would say that this is kind of a standard way to set up optimal transportation. And maybe before we uh, keep going, if there's any questions about any of this stuff, I'll be happy to take this at this point. Otherwise, we can. Um, keep moving along. So, from the coupling perspective, what's the relationship between uh, that distance and like just TV distance? Well, I mean, first of all, the TV distance is a special case of uh, what I'll talk about in the next slide, which is the Wasserstein distance when you work with a Hamming metric with a Hamming metric on your on your space. So you can actually, if you take this CXY to be the Hamming distance, right, the indicator where X and Y are equal or not, you get exactly the same. Yeah. So I guess also for for understand. A, a C of X, some special C of X's will create a Monge uh, solution. Is that right? No, that Rather, is, some is, special yeah. assumptions. Well, for example, if you have densities for these distributions, right, then yeah. you can, and I'll talk about it shortly. Kantorovich actually subsumes this Munch right, formulation as a special. Yeah. Special couplings that also correspond. If you coupling, exactly. you need the pi to be. You, need to be, delta, delta you need to be delta, exactly. delta right? Exactly. right. right. Delta's in both. Oh, it's right, right. Both. So if you're if the coupling concentrates on a graph of a function, then essentially yeah. you're back in mood. Yeah. And this happens, for example, when you have density and you work with with L two costs or with quadratic costs or other nice costs yeah. uh, that you may think about. Yeah. So very good. So this is going to overshot the transport. Maybe a few things that I would like to mention about this guy before moving on. So first of all, like uh, Alex's comment, it subsumes the Munch formulation as a special case. If indeed there is a transportation map, a deterministic function that is optimal for a given transportation problem, this coupling in the moon, in, in the Kantorovich problem will be able to retrieve that. So that's like just a simple sanity check. But perhaps more important from our perspective, notice that the Kantorovich optimal transport is actually a linearization of the moon formulation, because if you can look at this problem closely, you quickly see that, first of all, we're looking at the linear optimization objective here, right, in this coupling pi. This is optimized over the set of couplings that is defined by linear constraints with respect to the coupling pi. So overall, this is a linear program, which is wonderful, because it means that it's computational tractable. And furthermore, that it adheres to loads of good structure for us to be able to, to use for analysis. In particular, it satisfies the strong duality principle. And this is uh, one thing that I would like to emphasize at this point. Duality allows us to rewrite the transportation problem as this maximization problem, or precisely you're supervising this linear form over here as your objective over pairs of L1 functions. I'm calling them P and C, usually referred to as optimal transport dual potentials. In the theory of optimal transport, there's some cost constraint that these functions should satisfy. Not very important at this point, but what I do want to highlight is that this dual is super useful for analysis, in particular statistical analysis of optimal transport distances, because it immediately ties empirical optimal transport to the supermodel of an empirical process that is indexed by these dual potentials, at which point you're kind of in the well familiar territory, let's put it like this, of empirical process theory, and we have a lot of very powerful tool and ample machinery in order to analyze such empirical processes and their in derived convergence rate for them. So I mean, again, not crucial at this moment, but I will get back to this point later in the talk. So I wanted to just highlight the utility of this tool. Yes. So for my finite dimensional uh, ignorant brain, mm -hmm. if this is a linear program, like I can sense an infinite dimensional linear program, but yeah. let's say it was a finite dimensional yeah, yeah. one. This is exactly the same as linear program you want to, or is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so, so then, then, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, uh, it's a great comic, right? You have a bunch of types, algorithms, like network flow algorithms and stuff like that in order to solve linear programs. 
I mean, one can argue that scalability there becomes quite problematic because if you think about how long would it take you to write to run a linear program on this on this on this specific problem, it would be it, sc it would scale like if you're looking at n time and distributions on n points, it will have a complexity that is cubic in this n. And if you're a classical optimization problem person, maybe that's okay. But if you think about the type of large scale problems that we care about machine learning, then cubic complexity really kills you quite fast. I mean. There are uh, maybe more points to be thought of in the context of large scale optimization. Even for classical optimization, people, that's not Come again? Even for classical optimization, people, that's very hard. That's what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm saying maybe moderate, small, moderate problems can still run that, but of course, for large scale problems, yeah. it becomes a problem. See? All right. Yes. She's talking about one. What's the implication of that constraint on this uh, form now that on the phi and psi yeah. functions being less than or equal to the C? That allow you to move to this sum now. What the why do you have that constraint on? Yeah, I mean it just pops out from linear duality theory. I mean this is the constraint that corresponds to this objective in the primal form that you're optimizing. If you work out your linear program duality, this is exactly what you show. Yeah. All right. And yeah, I mean, at this point, I do want to kind of start thinking about optimal transport as a discrepancy measure between probability and distributions. I think intuitively it makes sense, right? The more different two distributions are, the higher the transportation cost between them should be. But the notion that makes this formal is one of the most interesting objects in optimal transport theory, which is that of the Wasserstein distance. And I mean, strictly speaking, this is nothing but your Kantarovich optimal transport problem with a special choice of cost, when you take your cost function to be a metric on the underlying space, a distance function, or perhaps a power of a metric. So this exactly gives us the definition of the Wasserstein distance of order P, Kantarovich optimal transport with a P root over here, where the cost function is taking to be a distance on the underlying space raised to the power of P. Now I'm using Euclidean spaces, Euclidean metrics here, just for simplicity of presentation, you can play this game over abstract metric spaces with little to no modification. That's the Wasserstein distance, and I mean, it. Is not called a distance for nothing. Indeed, it metrizes the space of interest, which is the space of probability distributions over that underlying metric space with a finite peak moment. This is what this little subscript P over here represents. And one of the unique characteristics of this metric space we're getting out of it, which we call the Wasserstein space, is it has a fascinating structure, in particular, a very rich geometry that is in many ways quite similar to the geometry of the underlying space, in this case, Euclidean geometry. And first of all, notice that Euclidean geometry is just a teeny tiny piece of this Wasserstein space, because the Wasserstein distance between two Dirac measures just boils down to the base distance between the corresponding points. We call these, we call this lifting the base metric to the space of probability distribution. And this really means that, well, any concept that is there in Euclidean geometry also lives in that Wasserstein space, but things here go well beyond just kind of embedding or containing Euclidean geometry, you can now take a lot of ideas that are very natural to think about in Euclidean spaces, like straight lines, like averages, like optimization even, and lift them to this abstract space of probability distributions as well. And I'll explain this in a second. I just want to take Sandra's question. Yeah. Why are you indexing the first term by looking P? It's just a space of probability measures, right? Of RD. Or what is, what is the looking P? The P means that you're assuming finite absolute moments, which guarantees that this distance is finite. Otherwise, you explode. Oh, you're saying some distributions don't even have, you're saying we don't accept all distributions. No, no, no. Yeah, so you have to have a finite absolute moment. So norm to the P integrated over your order. Oh, space of all the measures have to be finite. Yeah, it's not all and then you qualify for this one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if we typically uh, work with P equals two, or is that what? Yeah, P equals two, P equals one or two. And that one is there, more finite variance, finite variance distribution? Yeah, yeah. 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 finite second moment, absolute second moment. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but you're right. P equals one, P equals two are the typical use cases. Some people like P equals infinity. It has some connection to differential privacy. So in privacy, it's true to see infinite, infinite lots of distance. But yeah, intermediate values are kind of nice to cover if you're doing theory, but are rarely used in practice. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, so let me give you a sense of how we can lift ideas from completing geometry to this abstract space of distribution. And uh, just to uh, give a few examples. For instance, in the Wasserstein space, you can ask not only how far two distributions are in the Wasserstein metric, but in fact, what is the shortest path between them 
in that Wasserstein space that connects them to one another. We call these Wasserstein geodesics. And these geodesic curves now give us a very natural way to interpolate between distributions, kind of smoothly deforming the one until you reach the other. And these types of ideas actually used quite a lot in computer vision applications for shape morphing and stuff like that. There's a very natural way to think about averages of a bunch of probability distributions in the Wasserstein space. We call these Wasserstein very centers. And again, just as an example, you can compute a very center between a bunch of distributions. But if you think about a very center between two, well, the very center between two distributions will be just the midpoint of the geodesic between them. And you can even perform optimization of functionals of probability distributions, let's say entropy or whatnot, over this Wasserstein space by running Wasserstein gradient flow algorithms, which we now can implement at scale in quite an efficient manner. So, I mean, all in all, what I'm saying is that there is a lot of good structure in this Wasserstein space for us to utilize, and all of this while working with a metric that has this unique capability to reflect the geometry of the underlying space, the geometry of your data, because a lot of data sets in modern machine learning applications are geometric in nature. Perhaps this explains the utility of this theory for designing and analyzing a lot of these different systems that we employ now. Employ now. Yes. What do you mean scale gradient flows? What, what dimension are you talking about? Come again? What dimension are you talking about in the TV? Like what is the ambient dimension? The ambient dimension will be the dimension of the space. Yeah, but I'm saying when you can like implement it, what dimension are you talking about? Like 100, 200, 1,000? Yeah, it's a good question. I would yeah. say you can go to 100, but I mean, I'm perhaps not up to speed with the most state of the art, with, with the state of the art of the, of the implementation. Yeah. No, for images, for images, you are pixels by pixels by three. So I think people are doing, I, I'm not sure if it's the same gradient flows, but I think people are, are doing mappings between, you know, minion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, efficient implementations nowadays, but, you know, Perhaps I'm not the person to comment mm -hmm. about the uh, most advanced state of the art. Curiosity. Yeah. yeah. No, good. <laughs> Great question. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, so that's Wasserstein distances, optimal transport, Wasserstein distances. And while all of this wonderful structure is quite compelling, I do want to emphasize that perhaps optimal transport and Wasserstein distances are not always the right figure of merit to have in mind, regardless the application at hand. And at this point, I do want to start kind of building towards this Grom of Wasserstein alignment problem. And to that end, maybe let me show you a couple of use cases where Wasserstein distances don't quite fit the bill. And as a first example, think that, well, consider the following situation. Let's say that what you want to do is just interpolate between these two horse shapes, right? Now, of course, you can think of these as point clouds. You can run a Wasserstein geodesic between them. You can sample points along this geodesic, well, fair and square. And what you'll get as a result is, for example, these two interpolants over here. And while they're kind of interpolating between the shapes, you can see that there's a bunch of artifacts here where particles are essentially flowing along the trajectory that minimizes the transportation cost, but really without respecting the local or global structure of the underlying shape. Wasserstein distances have no incentive to look at the global structure, and therefore, I mean, obviously, this is not what we're, we're, what we're looking to do. If anything, we're looking for something that behaves more like a rigid body optimal transport that performs the interpolation while respecting the structure of the shape at hand. And again, if this is what your task is about, the Wasserstein distance and optimal transport theory is not quite the right figure of merit to have in mind. And maybe this is one example. Another canonical example where Wasserstein distances don't work is when you want to quantify discrepancy between probability distributions that live in completely different spaces without a natural common embedding. Now, admittedly, this is a horrible example. You can easily embed both of these in R2. But just think about two separate metric spaces with two different metrics defined on them. There's not even a way to define the Wasserstein distance in such a situation. Let's, yet the question still stands. I mean, it's reasonable to try and understand how different two such distributions are. And again, Wasserstein distances do not provide the answer in this case. And what I'll try to show you next is that both these situations, as well as an aptitude of others, can be holistically treated under the single canopy of an alignment problem under this gromov wasserstein paradigm. So this is what I would like to start talking about next, all right? And yeah, I mean, alignment is also the canonical way to motivate the gromov wasserstein problem. Essentially, when you, when you want to learn a matching or a correspondence between two heterogeneous data sets, this type of need comes up in a bunch of different applications, if it's object or shape matching, if it's single cell genomics, where you look to do multimodal analysis of biological data, if it's alignment of language models, where you essentially want to learn a translation between word embeddings of two different languages, and many, many more. 
And in these types of applications, we typically care about two things. First of all, we want to quantifiably, quantifiably compare how similar or different these two heterogeneous data sets may be. And then on top of that, perhaps even more importantly, you want to obtain a matching or a correspondence that nicely aligns them with one another. And the Grove of Wasserstein distance is basically defined or designed, if you will, in order to achieve both these objectives simultaneously. So let me start kind of building towards that definition. And maybe for concreteness, I will use this object matching task as my running example. All right. So we want to learn a matching between these two geometric objects. We want the matching to respect the local and global structure. So maybe kind of matching head to head, shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet, and so on and so forth. Now, keep in mind that these objects need not lie in the same space. So maybe you're actually looking at something that looks like that. And the very first thing that I need here in order to get to my definition is a mathematical model for my shapes themselves. And for that, I'm going to use the notion of metric measure space. So what are these? Well, first of all, a metric space, x dx, y dy, kind of encodes the geometry. And then it is further endowed with the probability distributions, mu here and mu there, that capture, well, the, the density or intensity of your pixel or particles or atoms or, or whatever else is relevant for the data you're thinking about. And with that, I can now go ahead and replace my geometric objects with their metric measure space models, which is kind of nice because it helps me, you know, abstract away the specific application. Of course, you can represent pretty much any data sets that you want in this very general fashion. Now, having that, the next thing that I want is my alignment, which in the language of optimal transport theory is, again, just a transport map, a function from this X space to the Y space that rearranges the blue mass into the red one. And again, I'm working with deterministic functions here just for simplicity. We'll switch to coupling Zala Kantarovich in just a moment. And up to this point, I mean, everything is quite similar to optimal transport, although here comes the key difference, which is how I'm going to define my cost function. And the idea is because I want this T to serve as an alignment, we're going to impose a minimum distance distortion requirement on it, essentially asking it to preserve as best as possible the pairwise distance distribution, matching close by points in the blue world to close by points in red, far apart ones in blue to far apart ones in red, or all, all in all, we want this thing to behave approximately like an isometry. And we're gonna set up our cost function to encourage exactly that. This is called the distance distortion cost. And you can see that it essentially penalizes for distortions of distances induced by this mapping T. And you can also notice that this one degree of freedom here, which is this exponentiation parameter Q that you can pick and choose based on the specific application. Usually Q equals one or Q equals two are the instances in, in practice. But if you're happy with these three ingredients, then up to switching from mappings to couplings, we essentially put them together and arrive at our definition of the gromov wasserstein distance of order PQ that formally is given by this infamized LP norm of the distance distortion cost, infamization over the set of all couplings. And on a high level, what this really quantifies is kind of the least amount of distance distortion you can achieve between your metric measure spaces when optimizing over all possible, possible matchings of these spaces, which are again, this time modeled by these couplings. So in this context, I'm thinking about a coupling as an alignment plan as opposed to a transportation plan. And already at this point, I think we can notice one key difference between the optimal transport problem and the gromov wasserstein problem, which is while optimal transport, Kantarovich optimal transport is this infinite dimensional linear program, the gromov wasserstein problem, because I'm sampling twice from the spy, is in fact quadratic in the coupling. And this quadratic nature of this functional is arguably one of the key reasons for why despite the fact that optimal transport theory has been making very rapid progress in terms of algorithms, in terms of statistics, in terms of structure, gromov wasserstein theory, despite being around for 12 years now, perhaps even more, has largely stagnated. We haven't been able to really penetrate this problem due to this quadratic nature. And one of the things that I'll show you today is how to linearize this problem and be able to kind of tap into the machinery of optimal transport in order to make progress on the study of the data. Yes. So in, in that formulation, it's is it immediate that if you look at any if you look at the flow when the measure when the transportation is flowing from one to the other, any intermediate one is also somehow preserving of whatever the the x pi. Let's say it goes through some z in the middle. 
So Z, B, Z, mu Z. Yeah. In it. Yeah. So, so actually, rho plus y type flows are not very well understood at this point. I mean, it's hard to even think about if these two are inherently different spaces, what exactly is the right notion of, let's say, Gromov was spent geodesic between them. That, because that's what your motivation that zebra that Haas thought. Yeah, so that was when my two spaces were the same and I could take the alignment coupling and just push through it, you know, through this interpolation map. But you're right, there, there is one proposal due to Strum uh, for Gromov Wasserstein geodesics, but in my opinion, it's not super satisfactory. Essentially, what uh, the proposal was is think about the flow corresponding to the, first of all, the space would be just the Cartesian product of X and Y. The distribution would be the optimal coupling and the metric would be a linear or a convex combination of the two metrics. But I agree, yes. I, mean, I don't think this is very satisfactory. And there's a lot of very interesting <laughs> questions in this space to think about, so yeah, great point. Right, so that's the definition. Any more questions about it? Yes. Uh, so is it completely clear this is not the Wasserstein distance if you have the same ambient dimensions? Yeah, yeah, it's not the Wasserstein distance. They're inherently doing two different things. So let me try and maybe give you a very simple example where you can see the difference, right? Imagine that you have, um, let's say, two data sets. One is just a rotation of the other, right, in the same space. What is the Wasserstein distance? What is an optimal transport? Well, you kind of rotate and translate in space, right, up until one uh, until one data set lands onto the other. As far as Grove of Wasserstein is concerned, all you have to do is this, right? Nothing is really being transported. The moment that you preserve your pairwise distance distribution, you're happy. You don't really have to do anything beyond that. And as I will explain in the next slide, Rome of Wasserstein distance between distributions that are isometrically connected to one another is just zero. It doesn't even see those differences. So you're like modding out by all the symmet the like exact rigid rotation. Yeah, isometry essentially. Yeah, translation, translation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Very good. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> All right, so yeah, so this definition goes back to Facundo Mervodi, a wonderful 2011 uh, Foundations of Computational Mathematics paper. I highly recommend opening up and reading. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar, this is actually an LG relaxation of a slightly more classical notion of a global Hausdorff distance that quantifies how far two metric spaces are from being isomorphic. And much like the Wasserstein distance itself, global Wasserstein distances, again, enjoy quite a bit of useful structure as far as an alignment problem is concerned. And I mean, maybe first and foremost, it's worth mentioning that the global Wasserstein distance is guaranteed to be finite and give you a meaningful notion of discrepancy between your metric measure spaces subject to very mild assumptions on those marginal spaces of yours. Usually we call this condition, the metric measure space having, sorry, a finite PQ size. Really, this is just a finite moment condition of order PQ. Pretty much any data set you need in practice will satisfy these requirements. And what this really means is that we now have this broadly applicable and highly robust way to compare pretty much any two data sets that you want. It doesn't matter anymore. These are Euclidean, non-Euclidean, graph data, manifold data. All of these are now comparable. All of these are now crunchable under this gromov wasserstein paradigm, which I think is quite useful. Beyond that, and that's uh, in relation to your question, global Wasserstein distance, in fact, nullifies if and only if there exists an isometric transportation map between the two metric measure spaces, which you can further understand indeed in those are distance with a bunch of symmetries and invariants, right? You can translate, you can rotate, you can apply any other, any other isometric transformation. Your global Wasserstein distance won't, or your global Wasserstein distance measurement rather won't change as a result of doing that. And again, this is quite useful if, for example, you think about learning up new nuisances and stuff like that. And lastly, once again, we don't call this a distance for nothing. It metrizes the space of interest, in this case, space of equivalence classes of metric measure spaces that are identified up to this isomorphic relationship from before. And I mean, personally, I think this is remarkable. You start from like a completely abstract space of equivalence classes of metric measure spaces. All of a sudden you get metric structure, you get tools for analysis, you can start thinking about geometry. There's a whole lot going on here. And admittedly, maybe we don't understand as much about the of Wasserstein geometry as we do about the Wasserstein at this point, but still there's quite a lot of useful structure for us to work with here and try to kind of mold it into principled alignment methods based on this gromov wasserstein functional. And yeah, I mean, really, if you want to come up with such principal methods, what you should be starting from is trying to develop a computational statistical theory for gromov wasserstein distances. And this is what I would like to start uh, getting into next, unless there are any questions about this stuff.
So just uh, repeating my question, I guess now if you mod out by isometries, you still don't get the bus pen distance. Still don't get the bus pen distance. Yeah. It's still not the bus. No, I mean it's it's a slightly different object. I mean, I mean one one perspective on this, like I said, I mean this is a quadratic uh, problem in 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 your coupling. The bus pen distance is a linear. I mean up to if you take bus pen distance to the p is a linear program program. But nothing here is really getting transported. Again, the point is just to preserve your pairwise distance distribution. So there's no physical transportation happening at any point. You're just looking to match. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's let's talk about uh, so we said algorithms and statistics. Let's maybe start from statistics because well, algorithms will predominantly run on sample data. So I mean this estimation question of I give you samples, what's the distance between the population distribution really sits in the background no matter what you do. And this is your standard estimation uh, setting where you get IID samples from the marginals. You want to estimate the distance between the populations. The typical approach here would be to first use the data in order to produce estimates of the distribution themselves. And these empirical measures I'm showing here are perhaps kind of the simplest variant one may consider, at which point you take those, you plug them into your gromov wasserstein distance, forming this empirical GW distance and kind of hoping that, well, for reasonably sized data sets, this empirical distance serves as a good, as a good approximation for the true distance between the actual populations. And the question is where, whether this is indeed the case. And well, at least asymptotically, we know the answer. And this goes back to Memoli's original work that showed that the empirical realm of Wasserstein distance is an asymptotically consistent estimator of the distance between the populations. But the thing is that the moment you take, you take another step into the non-asymptotic regime and you ask, well, okay, but what is the rate? at which this empirical estimation error actually decays to zero. Well, this has remained a wide open question uh, for more than 12 years now with no rates available whatsoever. And obviously, I mean, this is quite a roadblock to developing any principled methods as we, um, well, were aspiring up to a few minutes ago. And the main first result that I would like to start building towards is really closing this gap and deriving sharp empirical convergence rate for the problem of Wasserstein distance. And the way we're gonna, essentially achieve that is by developing a new duality theory, a new dual representation, a variational form for this global of Wasserstein distance that will, on a high level, linearize it, but importantly, will give us an objective that contains a certain optimal transportation problem as part of it, which will connect the global of Wasserstein problem we're trying to understand to the well-understood problem of optimal transport and essentially will allow us to kind of tap into this well-developed machinery of optimal transportation in order to start making progress on the problem at hand. So yeah, let me show you how this works. And I'm gonna treat a special case, an, an important special case, I would argue, but a special case nonetheless, which is that of the quadratic gromov of Wasserstein distance between Euclidean metric measure spaces with possibly different dimensions. Fourth moment condition over here just guarantees that my distance is finite. And the quadratic gromov of Wasserstein distance is written over here. Sometimes we call it the two, two, GW distance because P and Q are both two in this situation. And the nice thing about the quadratic cost is, well, obviously you can expand it, right? So by expanding it and collecting terms, then up to this assumption that my populations are centered, which comes for free because of invariance to translations, I can now split or decompose my quadratic norm of Wasserstein distance into the sum of two terms. The first of which depends only on the marginals, essentially contains moment-like expressions that only depend on mu and u, and for all purposes, we can think of it as a constant, right? Nothing really is interesting happening with this S1 bit, whereas the second portion of the decomposition captures the dependence on the coupling, and well, at least from an optimization perspective, obviously, it is just this S2 that is interesting. So this is exactly what we're going to try and do, derive a dual form for this S2 bit of my decomposition. And well, the experts in the room may already have noticed that the main roadblock towards doing so is the presence of this term that I've marked in red, which is notably quadratic in phi, which kind of precludes you from being able to directly apply duality ideas for linear optimization and kind of figuring out how to deal with this quadratic portion is the main thing we have to wrap our heads around. Let me show you how we do that. And well, I mean, nothing really too complicated. You don't like the fact that the term is quadratic and not linear? Let's linearize it, right? And the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to replace this red term over here with this simple optimization problem. You can easily check if you differentiate this guy, find the critical point, plug it back in, you'll go back to your original expression. And by further noticing that this critical point that I'm denoting by this AIJ star of phi over here 
just looks like half the correlation between xi and yj with respect to this optimal coupling phi, then simply by applying motion Schwartz inequality, I can further restrict my optimization domain to this bounded interval over here, where m u nu is just the root of products of second moment, which obviously pops up as a result of the application of motion Schwartz. All right, so we have this. Now, having that, let me pull the interval over the AIJs outside, rewrite everything in matrix form to bring me to the following expression, where now the optimization is over all the X times the Y size matrices that are entry-wise bounded by the same M U nu over two constant from before. And once we're here, then we're actually quite in business. Because if you allow me to think of this expression under the integral as some weird new cost function, CA, obviously parametrized by this matrix A, then what we have inside this dashed box over here is exactly an optimal transportation cost with respect to the CA cost function. And this brings me to the promise dual where I now was able to write the second bit of my decomposition of the bromo wasserstein distance in this variational form. Again, the objective has this optimal transportation cost associated with my CA cost function corrected by some for being as norm square of this matrix and optimized over all auxiliary matrix valued variables A. And again, the key here is that optimal transport sits on the right hand side. And this gives me a bridge between these two problems and will allow me to start utilizing tools we have for the study of optimal transport in order to understand a few more things about the growth of what the problems. All right. So that does it yeah. generalize for more general uh, metrics? Yeah, so th that's a great question. For now, we know how to do this for Euclidean spaces. Uh, you can actually do a similar thing for, let me just go back to the function of the distance. Yeah, you, you can do a similar thing for any GW distance where P and Q are even, because you can essentially decompose in some way. You'll get a much more complicated dual than the one I'm presenting here. But admittedly, for the moment, we do not know how to do this over spaces that are not Euclidean. I imagine that when you're working over Hilbert spaces and you do have an inner product structure, you should be able to perhaps run through a procedure that is similar to that. But this is a very interesting extension to think about and one that is indeed very, very important going beyond these Euclidean uh, spaces to more abstract uh, spaces of interest. So yeah, that's a great, great point. But yeah, I will definitely just focus on this quadratic case, at least for- The trouble term is the crossing term. Come again. The trouble term is the crossing term. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you have an inner product structure, maybe right, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, no, I, I guess there's, there's some reference of this optimal transport distance for Kalman filters. I'm not sure if you, they're aware. This reminds me of this. Like, so what, what is that? No, I just, um, I think they like check like the second moment and the cost depends on the second moment of the, the um, correlation functional of the function. I mean, yeah, so, so it sounds like it is very, very it reminds me of because, this, but... yeah, that's a great point because what this A matrix really is, I mean, the optimal choice of A, I can tell you what it is. The kind of, the utility of this specific relational form is actually decoupling A from the coupling, yeah. right? To have coupling on one side, A on another side and don't have them interact. That's kind of what unlocks the analysis. But you do know what the optimal A is. The optimal A is this correlation matrix, yeah. right? So, I mean, I think it's very much related. To yeah, yeah, I think I, there is some new feature about yeah. like... I, I would be very interesting to get in a reference for that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ariane. Yeah. Uh, so basically your hope is that you're sort of you're going to do some sort of alternating optimization, committing A and then looking at the optimal transport. Well, you'll have to wait. I'll, I'll show you towards okay. the end of the talk. Oh, but that's the hope that you Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Any other questions? Right. So let me show you what we can do with this tool. And first of all, like I promised, we can close this uh, well decade long gap and actually derive the sample complexity, rather sharp empirical convergence rates for the gromov wasserstein distance. And starting from the upper bound, we have matched lower bounds. I'll talk about it in just a moment. But for now, let's uh, look at this upper bound over here. I'm considering compactly supported distributions. And as you can see, my bound really comprises two pieces, two portions. The first one over here that converges at the parametric n to the minus half rate, this is really the convergence rate of this like constant of this F1 bit of my decomposition plus a certain centering bias. I'll say more about this in just a moment. Whereas the second term that is much more involved and in particular captures the dependence on dimension, this is your convergence rate for the S2 bit of the decomposition. The analysis here is much more involved and in particular relies very, very strongly on our duality theory. And again, I'll show you the proof or at least the main ideas of the proof in just a moment. But before that, perhaps someone comments about this result. 
Uh, first of all, yeah, so like I said, I mean, these rates are sharp. We have matching lower bounds, but don't worry about that for now. We'll get to lower bounds after we conclude the upper bound discussion. More interesting is to think about, well, how does this rate actually depend on dimension? And well, first of all, you can observe that the curse of dimensionality indeed manifests itself in this rate. I mean, dimension enters in this uh, denominator of the negative exponent of the number of samples, which means that as the dimension of your problem grows, this rate will deteriorate exponentially with that dimension, which is, well, maybe undesirable, but unavoidable because the rates are sharp. And in particular is kind of expected for these types of estimation problems. But what I think is very much worth noticing is that while depending exponentially on dimensions, the dependence is actually on the smaller of the two dimensions, which means that if you're working in a problem where one distribution is super high dimensional and complex, and the other one is simple and lives in a lower dimensional space, the rate will actually adapt to this lower dimension. We'll get again an acceleration as a result of that, which I think is, is quite nice to have. Now, beyond that, the rate over here and the structure of the bound is very much in correspondence to the best rates we have available for optimal transport, which is to say that at least from a statistical standpoint, estimating Wasserstein or Grom of Wasserstein has a comparable difficulty. And lastly, I'm presenting here a two sample rate. We also have a one sample rate in the same paper. The bound is actually exactly the same. One sample only corresponds to the situation where we're estimating just one of your distributions as opposed to both of them. All right, so that's the bound. And with that, I do want to take you through the main ideas of the proofs of the proof, because I think it does a great job at kind of highlighting the role of duality here and how it really unlocks this entire derivation. So maybe let's talk about that a little bit. Any questions? Sure. So if we have like two different samples of NMM, what do you have? Oh yeah, I mean you, you can adapt that. Uh, what is the time rate for NMM? Uh, well, uh, I I don't remember. I mean, I think we worked it out at some point. But uh, yeah, this this result assumes that you have the same size data set. But the, the adaptation is standard. I mean, you replace n, I think, with something that looks like n plus m over n times m. That should be the behavior. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Right. So proof. And really, the first thing that I want to do here is decompose my analysis of this quadratic W distance into the analysis of its two components, S1 and S2, right? That's what we have the composition for. So I really want the bound that roughly looks like this. But notice that it is not as trivial as it may seem at a first glance in this specific situation. Because if you remember my decomposition of GW into the sum of these two terms required the distribution to be centered. Now, while you can assume without loss of generality that your populations are centered, this need not imply that the empirical distributions corresponding to these populations are centered as well. So really what's happening in the background here is that there's a certain centering step where you center your empirical distributions by the sample mean, at which point you can decompose, but then you have to account for the bias that is introduced by the centering step. And this is where this order of one over root n term on the right-hand side comes out from. But I mean, up to this fact, we can decompose and indeed now analyze both these two terms separately. The analysis of S1 is very simple. Estimating S1 is essentially estimating some moments of a marginal distribution, which again, we can do at a parametric rate of estimation. And if you can, if you combine these two terms over here, this together, they essentially gives rise, sorry, to the first expression in my upper bound from the previous slide, the one that converges at the parametric rate. Right? So, so this takes care of, of this first bit. And really the lingering question is, okay, but what about the rate of convergence for S2? And like I said, I mean, this requires a little bit more work, and in particular, it hinges on our duality theory. And the way I want to go about showing you the proof for the rate of convergence for S2 is actually starting from a looser bound. I want to first show you a derivation of a bound that doesn't depend on the minimum of the two dimensions, but rather on the maximum. It's slightly easier to explain. And once we have, the, have this looser bound that depends on the maximum, I'll show you how to refine it in order to get the right dependence on the smaller of the two dimensions. Okay, so let's start from this looser bound. And the first step in the derivation is to invoke duality, which allows me now to reduce the question of estimating S2 to that of estimating an optimal transportation cost, which I know how to do up to the fact that I'm carrying the supermoon over the matrices A with us just from how the dual form looks like. And this bound over here kind of suggests that, well, whatever is the analysis you know how to execute for optimal transport, here you'll, be able, you'll have to be able to execute uniformly in the matrices A. And this is exactly what we're going to do, right? Now, the way such 
Empirical convergence rates analysis for optimal transport distances usually proceeds by studying regularity of the underlying optimal dual potentials. And in our case, just by exploiting the specific structure of the CA cost function, we can show that for any matrix A, the corresponding dual potentials are concave, Lipschitz, bounded, and further get uniform in A control over the Lipschitz and infinity norms, essentially bounding them by this constant over here. And this gives us our uniform in A regularity theory. And having that, we can proceed with the analysis. Let me just pick things up from this green star expression over here. And in order to do that, if you just allow me to define these two function classes, F and G, as the classes of all functions that satisfy the set regularity properties, just by invoking Kantarovich Rubinstein duality, your regular optimal transport duality, I can now upper bound this green star over here from above by the sum of these two expected suprema of empirical processes that are indexed by all possible dual potentials at play, right? When we take the union over all relevant A matrices. But thanks to this uniform in A regularity theory, I can further upper bound this expression by replacing these classes with the F and G classes from above. And once here, well, that's your standard empirical process theory framework, and we have a lot of excellent tools in order to analyze these expected supermind derived convergence rates. In particular, we use some chaining arguments together with bounds on entropy integrals in order to show that each of these expected suprema actually converges at a rate that looks like n, the number of samples, to the minus two over dimension. And maybe to give you a sense of where this specific rate is coming from, well, I mean, you can morally think of Lipschitz and concavity as having control over first and second derivatives. And you can make this rigorous and indeed show that the smooth, smoothness index of these F and G function classes is exactly two. And this two is precisely what sits in the numerator of this negative exponent over here. All right, so this is where the rate is coming from. And having these two bounds, you max them up. You, you max them out and you get the looser bound that I promised, the one that depends on the larger of the two dimensions. Now, this is not quite what we want just yet, but I mean, this is, the underlying ideas for at least arriving at this expression over here. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll show you how we refine this in order to get dependence on the mean. Good? All right. So to go from here to the actual bound we're targeting, which depends on the smaller of the two dimensions, we're going to use a very interesting recent observation that is called the lower complexity adaptation principle, the LCA principle. Actually, came out from Axel Monk's group in the University of Göttingen. And let me explain how this works. Now, just for concreteness, of course, not, as, not, not uh, uh, restricting generality. I'll just assume that dx is the smaller of the two dimensions, again, just to make this slightly more concrete. And now, instead of defining this G function class over here, let's recall that in any given transportation problem, I'm, all, I'm always allowed to take my dual potentials to be C transforms. Of one another, where a C transform is defined over here, you can notice that it's kind of reminiscent of the Legendre transform from context analysis. If you work with quadratic costs, that well, they essentially become the same thing. This is almost uh, the same thing up to some constant corrections. And having that, I can now go ahead and replace any appearance of a G function class with the corresponding C transform of the F class in in play. So. All right, there we go, right? So I can replace any appearance of the G class with a C transform of the corresponding F class, because again, I know it's enough to only look at potentials that are C transform of the, of the former. And having that, this is where we invoke the LCA, the lower complexity adaptation principle, that tells us that the L infinity covering number of any function class is in fact exactly the same as the corresponding cover number of a C transform, right? You can use exactly the same epsilon net size Essentially, take your first epsilon net C transform of that would be the epsilon net for the C transform class. And having this, I can effectively go ahead and replace any appearance of a dy dimension with the dx dimension because, again, I'm just using the same size epsilon net, which brings me the promised bound that depends on the minimum. And if you combine this with two parametric rate bounds from the previous slide, you arrive at the overall upper bound from the statement of the theorem. So yeah, that's the proof. And really for me, the key step here is this one right here, the reduction from Gromov-Wasserstein to optimal transport, which is enabled by uh, the dual form that was presented before. All right, any questions about this? Uh, is there a typo? Where? And then there's a two in front of n to the power of two divided by dx dy. 
Where? Here? Yeah, in formula A, it should have two. Two times n. Sorry, you want a two here? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, all of this is up to constant. Okay. Yeah, so it should, should have been a squiggly, perhaps inequality, but sure. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, and this is pretty much the uh, story of the upper bound. Let me say a few words about the lower bound. So I promised a, low, a, a matching lower bound, perhaps matching up to the logarithmic term that appears in the upper bound, but then we, uh, we don't really sweat about logarithmic terms. And the proof of this guy actually also relies on quite an interesting reduction where we can lower bound the quadratic gromov wasserstein distance by this so-called W2 Procrustus distance, which is what you get when you infimize your two Wasserstein distance over all orthogonal transformations of one of your distributions. And having that with a specific choice of populations mu and mu, and nothing fancy, I'm just taking my mu to be uniform over the ball, mu to be uniform over the scale by two version of that ball. So you can see, I mean, there's a lot of symmetry in this choice. And for this specific choice, thanks to this, lemma over here, I can lower bound the two sample empirical convergence rate of the gromov wasserstein distance by the one sample empirical convergence rate of this W2 procrustis over here, which really starts to smell like something we should be able to analyze. I mean, we have a lot of lower bounds for statistical rates of gromov wasserstein distances. Perhaps the annoying part is that we're still carrying this infimum five minutes. Really? All right. So I'll, yeah. I mean, anyway, you, 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 you get to this as a lower bound if you employ essentially a covering argument of this orthogonal group up to higher order terms that would not affect the rate. I can pull out the infimum from my expectation, at which point the symmetry of mu, of course, means that hitting it by this orthogonal matrix u does nothing, so this infimum is gone. And one last step, we just use monotonicity of Wasserstein distances in their order to get a lower bound in terms of expected one sample W1 rate. And this is a well understood object. In fact, you go all the way back to 69 to Dudley and uh, you get a lower bound that looks like n to the minus one over d as the best possible rate you can in general hope for convergence in this setting. And well, I'm hiding a bunch of technical details here, but once you have that, you can pull all of this together in order to obtain your lower bound on the empirical rate for the global Wasserstein distance, and together with the upper bound, we now have this sharp account of estimation rates, which, uh, well, is useful to have in order to calibrate data set size in um, actual applications. Yeah. Yeah, so is this a typical lower bound, or is it, because you're here, you have the supremo on the left. Mm -hmm. And this is an ex explicit example, but not necessarily, right? So, I mean, the supremum indeed, if I can pick, it allows me to essentially pick specific distributions in order to get my lower bound. Uh, whether this there, this rate would hold for any uh, choice of distributions, well, I can maybe comment about whether this rate holds for any choice of distribution for the Wasserstein distance. And indeed, if you go back to that paper by Dudley, it showed that the only thing that this is not a pathological rate. I mean, you don't need to cook up horrible distributions in order to get this slow convergence. You just need to assume that you have a density on RD for mu, and you get that bad rate. I would imagine the same thing holds true for this situation, but I mean, our argument does not account for that at the moment. I take the super room, pick a specific choice, and lower bound that uh, further. But yeah, I mean, right, where, where is this coming from? This is essentially because you are working in RD, and you may be thinking of an empirical measure that is essentially described by points, and you want to transport them to something that looks like balls in order to cover Euclidean space or a region of that space. So. Yeah, this is uh, really what's sitting in the background here. Okay, so these are rates. Now I have what, two and a half minutes to tell you about algorithms? All right, so that's a challenge. But yeah, let me maybe just give you the highlights. So, uh, right, so from a computational perspective, switching gears a little bit, let's talk about computation. Unlike the linear optimal transport problem, gromov wasserstein actually turns out to be equivalent to what's known as a quadratic assignment problem. QAP, this is a hard done convex optimization problem. In fact, we know that it's NP complete. And I mean, of course, this is quite the blow to just the applicability of this framework as such. And indeed, it's inspired a lot of work and quite a rich body of literature looking at computationally tractable relaxations or reformulations of the gromov wasserstein distance along with algorithms for approximately computing them. And perhaps the most popular such instance is the entropically regularized Romo-Wasserstein distance that is written over here. You can see that I'm essentially 
adding to my distance distortion cost and the scale divergence penalty on my alignment plan that kind of in, encourages weakly dependent couplings, if you will. Sometimes we call these fuzzy couplings in the literature of optimal transport. And this idea is really inspired by entropic optimal transport. Because what happens there is that when you add this convex entropic penalty to the originally linear optimal transport problem, you arrive at a strongly convex optimization problem, which you can solve very fast using synchron fixed point iteration algorithm. This is a brilliant observation from back in 2013, I think, by Marco Futuri. But unfortunately, things are not as nice for Grumble Wasserstein because our original problem is not linear, it's quadratic in pi. In fact, you can check that it's a concave function in pi. So you're taking a concave function, adding a convex regularizer. You don't get a whole lot of structure in return, but I mean, thankfully, there was still just enough over there for people to be able to derive various heuristic methods for approximately computing this guy. And I'm saying heuristic because none of these methods had any convergence guarantees associated with them. Uh, they were not, by the way, not asymptotic and definitely not a not asymptotic account for the convergence rate. So, I mean, there was a bunch of methods they were used for applications, but nothing that I can attach formal guarantees for. And yeah, there were other gaps associated with this problem. For example, people largely think about this entropic version as an approximation of the unregularized problem. There was actually no formal bounds quantifying the approximation gap or even showing that it's finite and you can tag along statistical rates with it because they were unknown for this entropic setting as well. Now, when we arrived at this problem, we were able to derive this first approximation bound showing that the gap between the two problems scales like epsilon log one over epsilon, in particular, demonstrating that you can indeed approximate to any desired precision the unregularized GW using this entropic counterpart. We also derived statistical rates, which in this entropic setting actually adhere to this fast parametric convergence, which is again, for those working in the field is not extremely surprising. This is basically an outcome of the inherent regularity of entropic dual potentials. I mean, the moment that your cost function is C infinity, potentials become C infinity, and then the smoothness index of the classes is as large as you want it to be. You set it to be dimension over two plus one and you get this parametric rate of convergence. So this is essentially that. But what I was hoping to show you guys is a new algorithm, or rather a couple of new algorithms that we proposed for computing uh, this fellow over here, once again, relies on duality, very much like Arian alluded to before, the idea would be to alternate between solving this entropic optimal transport problem and minimizing over the matrices A. And well, in particular, we can we have some stability analysis for this objective. We can show that you can control, well, we can derive first and second order for shed derivative of this objective. Morally, you can think of these as a gradient vector and a Hessian matrix of this map. And based on that, we can gain further control over eigenvalues of this matrix and show that, well, in certain regimes, this is a convex problem. In fact, the objective is L smooth, right? So gradients are ellipses with the smoothness parameter that is just the max of these two bounds from above. And all of this together essentially allows us to employ fast or accelerated gradient methods with an inexact oracle in order to solve this problem and for the first time derive uh, convergence rate. So yeah, maybe I'll, I'll skip all of that. Our algorithm adheres to the following guarantee in the convex regime that controls the gap, optimality gap of your iterates versus the global optimum. The rate here, by the way, corresponds to your optimal net trough uh, rate for smooth constraint optimization, right? So that's uh, one of our k square dependence for the first term is as good as you can hope it to be, plus a certain penalty for the inexact oracle, which is kind of the synchron part of it when you run synchron to get a proxy coupling. And yeah, I mean, probably I don't have time to get into any of the details, but the proposed algorithm offers a significant speed up over the kind of most popular, I would say, algorithm that for years and years was the one that people were employing in this space. We reduced the time complexity from cubic to quadratic, and this is also subject to formal guarantees. So this is uh, one side of the story. Now, they came out last, late last year, they came out a nice refinement of this approach, of this near descent approach that is able to exploit a certain low rank structure of the problem, if indeed present, and the yeah, the speed up was actually kind of shaving off one of the n factors and making it into a dimension dependent factor. So giving an algorithm that has empirically a comparable complexity to ours. But again, this is for now the only method that actually has any guarantees associated with it. So in some sensitive applications, if this is important, 
then this is perhaps something to, to keep in mind. Yeah, so yeah, in the interest of time, let me skip. Uh, yeah, I don't know why my clicker is not working very well today, but let me skip this uh, summary. These are the papers if you want to check out the detail. And with that, guys, I'll stop. I'm sorry if I'm over time. This was really uh, fun. And thank you for all the wonderful questions. If there's anything else that you guys would like to ask, feel free. Thank you. Maybe one final question for uh, I just have one uh, about the epsilon. So how big is the epsilon should be so that all the theory works? Because you don't want epsilon to be larger than your estimation error, right? Otherwise, it's going to ruin the Yeah, very good. So the uh, question is in, in, in which regard? So as far as convexity of the problem, yeah. based on just lower bounding, the smallest eigenvalue, you can get the simple less sufficient condition on this epsilon that guarantees convexity. Now, if you're in this convex regime, we have one algorithm that you can write, which is the fast accelerator method. But this uh, is method. much smaller than your estimation error, so you don't use... Yeah, yeah, but, but this, this may be actually quite large. I mean, oh. I, I'm not saying this is a small quantity, but even if you're outside this convex regime, we have a convex, we have an algorithm for this non-convex situation that just exploits the smoothness of the problem. This is thanks to um, a nice approach by Gadini and Land from 2016. And it actually has a nice kind of adaptivity property, which is you don't require your objective to be a priori convex, but if, if it happens to be convex, then you get a certain acceleration in terms of the rate. So, I mean, yeah, we can compute irrespective of epsilon. Of course, the algorithm for the convex case is simpler and faster, but uh, yeah, we also have a method outside of that regime. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh... Thank you, guys. Really fun. Yeah. See you.